I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 is our text. Uh, and if you don't have a Bible with you and you're in the room, uh, grab one of the Bibles that are in the seats around you. Turn to page 1165 and you will find Philippians chapter 2. Be able to follow along with us. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one of those with you. I uh, had a, a gentleman who, who let me know that he took one of the Bibles and gave it to one of his nurses that was giving him chemotherapy. And he said, is that okay? And I said, absolutely. Absolutely. So we're, we're serious. We want you to take them and use them because we know if you read the Word of God and apply the Word of God, God will change your life. And, and if you're joining us online, we're glad that you joined us. And if you need a Bible, please let us know. We will deliver one to you, mail one to you, we'll get one to you one way or another because we want you to have God's Word and read God's Word and apply it to your life as well. Hey, uh, let me just mention one other thing before we dive into the text, and that is uh, next weekend is probably my favorite weekend of the year uh, because we're doing the baptism party on June 6th at 6 o'clock down at London Bridge Beach. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you have not yet been baptized, and you're even thinking about it a little bit, you want to plan to do that. You want to sign up for it, you can do it online, you can fill out a Connect card, drop it in the offering box. We just want to help you be obedient to Jesus. But this is a fun day. Everyone's invited to come and cheer and shout. Uh, we always have surprise baptisms as well as planned baptisms. And uh, 30, 40, 50 people uh, will, will declare their faith in Jesus Christ in the waters of the channel uh, with boats going by who don't have a clue who Jesus is. I think it's just a cool thing. So, um, you know, just uh, don't, don't let anything get in your way. And if you're tuning in and you're thinking, I'd really like to do that, just come on down. We'll, it doesn't matter where you travel from. We'll, we'll help you get here or we'll uh, come there and baptize you in, in your city, wherever that is. We're, we're good with that. Hey, uh, how many of you would say that uh, you work out at least re semi-regularly? How, how many of you work out? Okay, a lot of hands go up. Some of you are like, sort of, I mean to. Does that count? How many of you like working out? Oh, how come there's more hands that went up than the people who work out? I don't, I don't understand that. See, I confess, I hate working out, okay? I spent my first 50 years of life avoiding the gym and refusing to exercise for exercise sake. Okay, now I would exercise, but it had to be like uh, wrapped up in some other activity. It had to be sports, you know. I played sports, I was active, I wanted to, you know, give me a ball, give me a court, give me something to do it on, and, and then I could exercise, but I didn't want to just work out. But just after turning 50, Calvary uh, got to the point where we were planning five weekend worship services. We were over at our McCulloch campus. We'd outgrown the four, and we said we're going to add another one, and I was like, I'm going to die. <laughs> i got to preach five times in a weekend. I don't think physically I'm not up to this, and so I did what I swore I would never do. I went to uh, the gym. I was already a member at Titan. Well, I say member. I donated my, my monthly <laughs> fees there. Showed up sometimes and talked to people uh, in the guise of working out, but but I went to the owner of Titan, and I asked him uh, for help, and he agreed, and so he became my personal torture, I mean trainer. And, and, uh, and now, by the way, don't think I'm some kind of workout warrior because three days a week, 30 minutes uh, was, was what I committed to, and, uh, and, and I've been pretty faithful to that, but I gotta tell you, people lied. You know what people all say, all the exercise people say? Oh, you know what, you start working out, you'll love it. You will love it. That is such a lie. Eight years into it, and there is not a bit of my body that loves it. But my body loves, you know, chocolate peanut butter ice cream. It does not love working out. So uh, you like working out, okay. Uh, but here's the thing, I like the results. I survived the five weekend services, uh, and, and now I, I continue to work out, uh, but that's because so I can keep up with my grandkids. Uh, and... That, that's a whole nother challenge. So today we're going to talk about working out, but not physically working out. Philippians chapter 2, we're just looking at two verses, verses 12 and 13. The Apostle Paul says, therefore, my beloved, he's talking to a church, to a people that he knows and he loves. He says, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, 
work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Uh, First thing I want you to see is that God is working in you. Did you catch that? For it is God who works in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. God is working in you. This is good news. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then God is joyfully working in your life to accomplish his will. That's what he says, right? Did you catch that? For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So, so God's excited about this, and he wants to accomplish his will in your life. And it's true for me, and it's true for you. And that means that God is working in you, and I think that is really cool. I think, I think that's awesome news. You, you can just understand that the God of all creation thinks enough about you that he's working in your life to accomplish his purpose, and he, and he loves doing it. And here's the thing, he's not gonna stop. Right? If you're a follower of Jesus, he's already promised he's going to keep doing this. If you just look over a page, you don't have to turn anything if you have a Bible like mine. In verse 6 of chapter 1, it says, And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So what God starts, God finishes. And so even when you're annoyed at God and you're being rebellious and you're walking away and you're trying to avoid him, he's still working in your life. Can I just tell you that when you're a follower of Jesus, that's one of the reasons that sin is no longer as enjoyable as maybe it was when you were lost? Because God's working in your life and the Holy Spirit's convicting you of sin and, uh, and, and you're like, hey, this isn't, this isn't like it used to be. No, it's not like it used to be because God has changed you. You're a new creation and God won't stop working in you until you're dead. Well, because when you're dead, you'll be in heaven. You'll be face to face and you'll be made whole. So God is actively working in your life, and he's working to bless you, whether you feel like it or not. God is working to bless you. God is working to help you become more like Jesus. He wants to grow you in the character of Christ because we can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. He, he wants to bless other people through you so what he's teaching you, what he's doing in your life isn't just for you. It's so that other people can be blessed by how you live, by how you act, by the decisions you make. And he is working in you to build his kingdom because he's got a purpose that's bigger than all of us. So God is at work in your life today and he wants you to work out your salvation. He wants you to work out your salvation. Can you, okay, it's God's will that you work out. But you work out your salvation. Now understand, he's not saying you work for your salvation. That's why I put that in there in parentheses. Not for your salvation. I, you know, can I just confess, I didn't like this verse uh, when I first read it. As a young Christian, and I'm learning, and I'm, and I'm reading, and I'm studying, and I'm like, oh, man, what does it mean? Work, work out your salvation, and yet we're saved by grace? Because the Apostle Paul who wrote this is really clear in Scripture that we don't earn our salvation, that we can't work for our salvation, that we can't you do anything to deserve being saved. In fact, he says in his letter to Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace you are saved through faith, that not from yourselves, that's a gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. So you're saved by grace, okay? It's a gift from God. In fact, in his letter to the Roman church, uh, Paul said in chapter six, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, so, so salvation is a gift, we are incapable of earning it, deserving it, or acquiring salvation, forgiveness, or eternal life on our own, period. We are not working for our salvation. But if you have received this gift, wait, let me just pause there. Have you received this gift? Okay. <laughs> About half of you have, the other half aren't really sure. So I'll just try that again. So 
Have you received this gift? Yes. Okay, but, so if you've received this gift, then put the gift of salvation to work. Work out your salvation. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to work out your salvation? And, and this is the place where, where I was like, okay, what is Paul trying to get at? How do we understand what it means to work out our salvation? So let me just invite you into a little fantasy to try to figure out what this looks like. Let's just pretend that uh, Bill Gates and Jeff Zuckerberg decided to bless Calvary with, you know, $100 billion or so. And in my wisdom, I decided to give all of you $10 million. Some of you like this fantasy, don't you? Okay, so you just got a gift of $10 million. What are you going to do with it? Now, don't answer that right now. But over dinner, over lunch, over next time you're with family, friends, life group, whatever, you guys can talk about what you're going to do with your $10 million, okay? What would you do? So you got $10 million. Now, what are you going to do with it? Because there's all kinds of options before you. Would you, wait, did someone just say 10%? If I give you $10 million and you only give God back 10%, I mean, I know you're supposed to give him 10%, but I would think you'd like, you know, give him a whole lot more than that. I mean, it's a gift. I'm just saying, but I, I, I like the idea, but uh, anyway, sorry, you guys distracted me now. So what would you do with it? So here's the thing. There's some th different things you can do with it, Okay. You could waste it. You could spend it on drugs and gambling and endless parties until all of it was gone. And some of you are going, $10 million? No way you could spend that much. Oh, yeah? How many of you remember this guy called MC Hammer? Okay, MC Hammer, if, if you're too young, just Google him, okay? He was really big in the 90s. He earned $70 million and was bankrupt in five years. $70 million in five years. You can waste it. So would you waste your $10 million? Or would you use it for yourself? Got to upgrade the house, got to buy some new cars, boats, toys, take some luxurious trips, maybe do an around-the-world golf trip and take the pastor. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, but... Uh, you know, would you use it for yourself? So you could waste it. You could use it for yourself. You could use it to bless others. Yeah, you got $10 million. You could use it to bless others. Someone already mentioned tithing. But, uh, you know, Calvary right now in this building, we still have $2 million in debt. We need to pay that down because we need to build more space because we got kids all over the place. We need to build some space for them. That's on the agenda. We've got a, uh, a building. We, you know, we've been praying for a building for the Parker campus for years. And guess what? We've got one in escrow. And uh, isn't that cool? They came to us and gave us a way below market value. And, and so we said yes. And, and last week we uh, approved that, that purchase. And, and here's the thing. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to take us about a half a million dollars to buy it and fix it up so that we can use it. So, you know, there, there you, use, you could use your $10 million to pay for that. Um, you could build wells in Mozambique. We're already doing that. You could build a whole bunch of wells. You could build compassion centers in Honduras. Uh, we're our starting number two in process. Uh, you could help out friends and family. You could do all kinds of good things. So you could waste it. You could use it for yourself. You could use it to bless others. You could also just kind of ignore it. You go, oh, come on. Who would do that? Well, like, I got $10 million. I'm going to dig a hole in my backyard probably have to borrow a bobcat for that, and, uh, and just bury the 10 million, and you cover it up, and you plant a tree on it, you're like, I got $10 million right there. Doesn't change the way you live, doesn't change the way you do life at all, you just happen to have money buried in the backyard. So what would you do with a $10 million gift? Now, here's the reality. God has given you a gift that is worth far more than 10 million or 10 billion or 10 trillion dollars. It's the gift of salvation. So what are you doing with it? The gift of salvation means that you have life, abundant life and eternal life, that, that you have forgiveness and love and hope that's been poured out in you 
And, and by the way, this is what allows us to live differently in a world that's a mess. Salvation means that it involves your experience, that God has redeemed you from your brokenness and your lostness, and, and he's given you life uh, and put it back together again. And, and he's given you all these experiences so that you can do something with them, and he's given you talents and resources, all of those gifts from God. And that gift of salvation involves your relationships. First and foremost, your relationship with Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. But then all those people that God has placed in your life for you to love. So what are you doing with your gift of salvation? Are you wasting it? You know, you have freedom in Jesus, but maybe you're living in slavery. Maybe you're enslaved to your addiction or to your destructive habits. And, and, and even though if the Son has set you free, you're free indeed, you're living like a captive. That's wasting the gift. Are you using it selfishly? You go, come on, how do you use the gift of salvation selfishly? Well, you know that you are forgiven. You know that you are loved by God. You know that heaven is your destination, but you're just keeping all that good news to yourself. So you can waste it. You can use it selfishly. You can use it to bless others. You know, uh, serving other people through ministries, you know, on the weekend here at Calvary because you could be, you know, helping out with tech ministry. You could be volunteering to help with children's ministry. You could be one of the first impressions, greeters, making people feel, you know, welcome when they come in. You could volunteer to work with student ministries. That's during the week. You don't have to even miss out anything on the weekend. Some of you are going like, student ministries? Yeah. Do you guys realize that we just had 103 fifth and sixth graders go to camp last week? They got back today. 103 fifth and sixth graders. It gets better. There are 78 junior hires leaving for camp this week. Yeah. Do the math. That's over 180, and that's not even including our high schoolers that are later this summer. Plus, we got kids' camps uh, that's going on in a couple of weeks. So uh, what I'm saying is there's all kinds of opportunities for you to serve people right here through the ministries of Calvary, or you can just serve the community. And that's why we have projects that we do, so you can like, use that gift of salvation and put it to work. You can live generously toward Jesus and others. You can offer kindness and encouragement to every single person that you meet. And by the way, that starts at home. So you can waste it, you can use it selfishly, you can use it to bless others. Honestly, you have the gift of salvation, you can ignore it. You can come to church every week. You can tune in every week. You can listen to Christian podcasts and music and all that stuff and ignore the gift of salvation because even though you have it, you can go on living in fear and desperation and hopelessness and anger and grief. So how are you using the gift of grace that God is giving you? How are you working out your salvation? See, we're challenged to work out our salvation, but we're challenged to work it out with fear and trembling. Did you catch that? Let me just read that again. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Um, why does Paul tell the church to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? After all, he's already told us we can't lose it. What is he trying to communicate to us that we need to know? Again, we're, we're you know, part of the church he's writing to. I mean, we're not obviously in Philippi, but we're, we're the heirs that are receiving this message. Why does he want us to work it out with fear and trembling? There's two reasons. First one is because the gift is priceless. It's priceless. First Peter, uh, the apostle says, for you know, you know, it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Look, Jesus shed his blood for you. Hey, do you, ladies, do you treat uh, your costume jewelry the same way you treat your real diamonds? 
<laughs> Some of you are like, I have real diamonds? <laughs> <laughs> of course you don't. Hey, wait, do you, do you treat uh, your fine china the same way you do paper plates? Some of the guys are like, I want to. <laughs> Repent. Um, so, no, we don't do that. We, when we recognize the value in something, we treat it with respect and care. And so Jesus gave everything to redeem you. He gave everything to redeem us. He sacrificed himself on the cross for you. He literally paid for your sin with his blood, suffered in your place. And, and so we've received this amazing, priceless gift called salvation. And Paul doesn't want us to waste it, ignore it, or be selfish with it because it's a priceless gift and you can't earn it. You don't deserve it. You can't purchase it. But you know what you can do with it? You can give it away and you only have more of it. Isn't that cool? If you give it away, you have even more of it. So the gift is priceless. And the gift comes with accountability. It comes with accountability. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the apostle writes, again, he's writing to the church, he's writing to believers. He said, for we, as followers of Jesus, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So if you've experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus, understand you are going to heaven. But you're also going to give an account of your life to God. Okay, you're going to answer to Jesus for how you have worked out uh, your own salvation. So at some point, each one of us, I don't know how it's going to play out, but each one of us is going to stand before God and give an account for how we used this gift of salvation. And it doesn't determine whether or not you go to heaven. It doesn't determine your salvation. It does determine your reward. Uh, now, I know this is a sobering thought, but it's meant to be. You know, as, as pastor of Calvary, I, you know, I'm the shepherd of this congregation uh, whether you're here physically or online, and I want you to pass that test with flying colors. I want you to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, when you're giving an account to Jesus for how you've worked out your salvation, how you've used this gift of grace. And, and so I want all of us to wrestle with that thought that we're gonna have to give an account for our lives for what we've done with this gift that's been given to us. Now, if you're not sure how you're doing, can I encourage you to do a little bit of homework? Go home and read Matthew 25. Do it tonight. Do it every day this week. I kid you not. Read it seven times. Matthew 25. It's three parables that Jesus told that are parables of judgment and warning. And in them, he tells you how you can be ready. Ready to give account. And then invite the Holy Spirit just to teach you and to show you how he wants you to live differently. Because that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to say, Holy Spirit, you know, open my eyes to see the word and to understand it and to live according to what you want. I promise you, God will meet you there. He will delight in that and he will speak to you. But they communicate God's standard for well done. But if you're sitting here and you're a follower of Jesus and you know that you need to make a change, I mean, maybe you're not wasting it always. Maybe you're not, uh, you know, being selfish with the gift of salvation always. Maybe you're not ignoring it always, but maybe there's some of that in your life. God's going to help you. If you want to make a change, God will help you. And Calvary will help you too. That's, that's why we offer things like Celebrate Recovery Monday nights at 6.30 in this room. That's why, that's why we offer Financial Peace University. That's why we offer counseling. That's why we offer life groups because all of us need help. Kind of like when I wanted to get a little bit more in shape, I had to go ask somebody to train me because I'm inherently lazy. I needed help. I needed accountability. I needed someone to cheer me on and tell me what to do. 
We all need that help. That's why we have the ministries the way that we have here at Calvary. And we're encouraging you to be a part of that. So today is a great day to really begin working out your salvation. I'm going to pray that you choose to do that. But I'm also going to tell you this. If you say, okay, Jesus, I'm serious. I want to start working out my salvation with fear and trembling. I want, I'm going to be ready for that day when I have to give an account. I'm going to do better. Uh, understand, it isn't going to necessarily be fun or easy. It's going to be tough. It, it's, it's, it, you're going to have to like really commit. So I told you eight years ago, all right, I'm going to go work out. I'm going to start doing this. Day one, I show up. I'm in a group. There's women in the group. They're older than me, okay? So I gotta try and keep up with them. I think I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty fit. Even, you know, I told you, I play sports and stuff like that. And so about two-thirds of the way through the workout, the room starts kind of spinning. You guys know the feeling, right? And I go over and hug the concrete, trying not to pass out. And I'm laying there. Breathing, trying to stay conscious, trying to, you know, work up the energy to get up. And, and I laid in a place where they actually had to step over me to leave. Yeah. I was really rocking it that day. But you know what I did? I went back. I went back. And, and you know what the trainer had me do? half as much as the women. I couldn't even work out like a girl. Okay, I grew up in a family of all guys. You know, pansy was the worst thing you could ever be called. And I couldn't even work out like a girl. And, 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 but I kept going back. And I kept going back and I kept doing it. I kept showing up. And I'm proud to say now I can work out like a girl. Okay? So some of you spiritually, you just kind of feel flabby. And you're afraid to admit it. You've been going to church for decades and you're not in spiritual shape and you're not really, you know, ready to take on hell with a squirt gun. You're not really ready to serve. You know that God needs to do a lot of work on you. Are you going to step up to the plate and show up? Are you going to commit to let God shape your life? Because you're the only one who can decide for you. It's gotta be you. And you've gotta decide, you're gonna listen to the Apostle Paul and you're gonna take this seriously and you're gonna work out your salvation. And, and if you're not yet a follower of Jesus and you're watching online or you're in the room, can I just tell you, we want you to receive the gift. Look, this gift of eternal life from Jesus is the very best thing that you can ever say yes to. And some of you are, are you know, here and you're just kind of like, yeah, I know I need to, but I never have, and I, I'm kind of thinking about it. And you just need to stop thinking about it. You take that step and say, I'm gonna follow Jesus beginning right now. And here's the thing, I can't give you the gift of salvation, but Jesus will if you ask him. All you have to do is just go, okay, Jesus, I give up. I need you to save me. Take over my life. And he'll do it. And then you can show up next week and we'll baptize you in the lake. <laughs> hey, we don't care when we baptize you. We just want to baptize you and celebrate with you. But you got to decide that you're going to follow Jesus and the followers got to decide that they're going to work out. Because it's the only way that we can be obedient and see the life that God has for us. Will you pray with me? Father, you are so good to us. It's almost beyond our comprehension the way that you just demonstrate patience with us, your rebellious, defiant, spoiled children. So God, we just confess that we complain about things when we are blessed enormously. We, we whine about a little bit of pain when our life is comfortable. God, we're lazy when it comes to reading the Bible and praying and serving, and, and we just want to repent. We really do want to work out the salvation that you have given to us. We want to do it seriously with fear and trembling. 
So God, meet us in this room. Meet us in our homes and change the way we think. Change the way we act so that we really can surrender fully to Jesus and live the life that he's called us to live. We cannot do it on our own. We need you to, to change our hearts. And so we give them to you now in Jesus' name. Amen.